Annual Exhibition Number One, we're really celebrating that the Jake With Library made it through the flood and are reopening. So, exciting. This show will be up through the end of the month. It was created as a custom piece for this space. So that meant um, Helen and I took measuring tapes and bed sheets and we did a lot of cutting and measuring and um, fitting. And then Peter did all of the painting uh, in less than two weeks and uh, the show went up and two days later the library flooded. So it hadn't been seen. That's why it's And so, yeah, this is all good. Here's your free hand. And <laughs> is this yours? I know, fabulous. Oh, no, no, no. So, okay. so uh, without further ado, Peter Schumann. Do something about Kopotkin. This is uh, not much of the pericule curriculum of American Academia at all, but it's uh, a very intense, uh, deep the thought. When you read them now, it's unbelievable how capitalism even dared to su survive, and survive this onslaught of anarchist thought, excellent stuff. Mutual aid instead of competition. Kropotkin was a biologist, geologist. He traveled for hundreds of miles on horseback through my Siberia as a young man and collected all these data that he then defined as the opposite of Darwinism, as uh, mutual aid, collaboration, as a, a major principle in nature, in plants, in insects, in forests, in uh, uh, flocks of birds, in migrations, in every aspect of nature. And then he also uh, concluded, yeah, this is all true of human history, because in addition to war and mayhem as being, as it is being presented as the major occurrences in human history, no, he said no. Independent of that, there was village life, there was culture underneath that other culture. And it existed in spite of the wars. In, in, it just succeeded to exist in opposition to the war-mongering nations and armies and so forth. Ugh. Yeah, that's what we learn in school. All the dates of Napoleon's wars and everybody. But very little information on the village culture that succeeded at the same time. So this year society is a warmongering society, as you know. 800 military stations around the globe. Yeah. Yeah. Then in order to fight the attack by Hamas, they put a giant warship for no particular reason into the sea uh, on taxpayer money, probably costs millions and millions to do it, of the and the citizens are allowed to pay for this total nonsense, and so on. Yeah, this is so typical. We call them the horrorists. They call the other ones the terrorists. But what teaches the terrorists is the horrorist. This big institution of horror, much bigger than any terrorism organization. And that's called the imperial, the United States, the empire of the United States, the warmongering empire of the United States. Well, it's pretty apparent. But it's not part of the culture. So the students, they either inform themselves, read a little copa, or not. OK, I love preaching. So now we start the real preaching. <laughs> This is called a Stradivola. This is an instrument I got from Poppy Gregory, hmm. our friend. She collected it, I don't know how. It was an instrument that they hoped they could utilize when they made uh, records with wax, I believe, and they didn't know how to produce fiddle sounds 
effectively, so they sort to put a bell on it, would improve sound quality. It didn't last very long, so I'm children. Of Mother Dirt's holy dirt, which makes us and unmakes us, nourishes us and unnourishes us. Ordinarily and extraordinarily. <laughs> we who are not only children of holy dirt, but are also ordinarily and extraordinarily idiots <laughs> of the idiot system. <laughs> Which governs our lives is meant, <coughs> meant to protect us from disaster, but instead provides us with reliably continuous disaster. If not here, there. If not there, here. somewhere else, uninterruptedly and tremendously. <laughs> Unpersecuted by international law, as you see right now in Gaza, protected by national and sectionalism, national exceptionalism. National exceptionalism. Paid for by taxpayer money. Originally meant to fix the potholes in our roads. In actuality, enlarging the forever biggest pothole, <laughs> the abyss. Our altogether abyss. Our altogether abyss. Say we, the clients of the truth industry, which provides us with all available versions of the truth, the half truth, the quarter truth, the upside down truth, 
plus all convenient omissions of the toast. But we, nevertheless, lucky possessors of even the smallest amounts of habitual or extra habitual happinesses ah, must be obliged by that sensation must be obliged by that sensation must parade it in the street must paint our flags with the bright colors of these happinesses and must toss them at the accumulated evil of the whole. Which, where, how, what, with the logic of happiness solutions must comprehend the consequences of the happiness obligation. The train, to train the untrained soul, to train the untrained soul, to sharpen, to sharpen, to sharpen the depressed mind for this logic. To not allow mother dirt's glorious dirt to succumb to the accumulated evil of the whole. To address the oppressed whole with the holes original intention, euphoria. Our own heads, unlikely but possible euphoria. Our own limbs and muscles dancing euphoria, which we must practice. Like this, it has to be done with euphoria gymnastics. They go like this. The first one go like this. That's the first one. <laughs> Good. <Yes. laughs> That's a euphoria practice number one. Next one's in the toes. <laughs> Good. Next one is a. <laughs> 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 
That's how it goes. That's about 55 others. You follow your practices that you have to practice every day. So, thank you. End of sermon. And now there's a table show. It's a Potkin biography, right? to the height of a biological principle. 1864, Kropotkin accepts a position in a geographical expedition across eastern Siberia. He intends to work on a theory of mountain chains and high plateaus. <laughs> but I am also interested in, in finding evidence of Darwin's theory. And here he is traveling over 50,000 miles, mostly on horseback. <laughs> Observing birds, wolves, deer, horses. And what he sees everywhere is collaboration with little to no conflict between animals of the same species. He sees wolves hunting in packs He sees birds helping each other feed and stay warm. He sees horses forming defensive formations against predators. Later, he expands his observations to bees, ants, li lizards, <laughs> Beetles. And shoaling fish. 
<laughs> and eventually, early and medieval human organizations. <laughs> and here, you see Krapani in 1902 receiving a cup of his recently published book, Mutual Aid, A Factor of Evolution. Mr. Kropotsky, can you read something for us, please? Okay. <laughs> I saw mutual aid, a mutual support, carrying on to an extent which may be suspected in a feature of a greatest importance for the maintenance of life, the preservation of each species and evolution.